Uh, hi, my name is Albert Cheng. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Box, where I work on a lot of Scala tooling and infrastructure stuff. But today I want to talk to you guys about uh, letting the Scala compiler work for you or with you. So when I came up with the, uh, the title of this talk, I basically stole it straight off the type level website. So if you go to typelevel.org right now, uh, the tagline is let the Scala compiler work for you. Uh, and one of the reasons why I stole the line was because I thought it was a, a very interesting way of viewing how a lot of uh, sort of type level or functional programming people view their language. So in a lot of sort of mainstream languages like maybe C, Java, maybe Go, uh, you sort of see the compiler as like just this, this tool that takes your source code and then dumps the bytecodes, the thing in between that lets you run your program and nothing more. And sometimes it can sort of feel like you're doing things for the sake of uh, just appeasing the compiler, right? So it's like in C, everything is an integer and, and there's no real help the compiler is giving you if you, if you mess up. Whereas in languages like Scala, Haskell, Idris, uh, OCaml, any of those more sort of functional, more expressively type languages, uh, I like to think of those as uh, languages where the compiler is there to help you uh, write your program, as opposed to being in your way, it becomes more like an assistant. And so that's sort of the message that I want to get across today, uh, specifically in a case of Scala. So if we, if we buy this idea that we, we want to work with the compiler instead of just appeasing the compiler, we need a way to sort of talk to it. And the type system is basically our, our go-to mechanism of communicating to, com to the compiler what we want. So we sort of write down a type signature that describes what it is we're trying to achieve, and then the compiler takes that information and can help you based on varying degrees of information it has based on that signature. So if we agree that the type system is our way of talking to the compiler, then it stands to reason that the more expressive the type system is, the more we can say to the compiler. And the more knowledge the compiler has about your code, the, in turn, the more information it can give back. The more information it gives back, it helps you refine your code a bit, maybe give some more type information, refine the types a little bit. And from there, you sort of have this uh, feedback mechanism where you're talking to the compiler, the compiler is talking back to you, so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, so the more the compiler knows, the more it can help you write your code. Some Scala examples of this. Uh, one is implicits and type classes, and that's really one thing that's missing in a lot of these languages, where uh, in one place you're sort of specifying the various instances of your type classes, and in another place you just say, I want this instance of a type class, and the compiler will go out and search for that thing for you. And oftentimes this will involve some maybe non-trivial searching mechanisms. So uh, one simple example would be, uh, the monoid instance for a pair type, right? So if you have a pair of A and B and you want the monoid for the pair, it, you, uh, the compiler will go out and make sure that A has a monoid instance itself and B has a monoid instance. And if it, that is indeed the case, it will give you the, it will compile for you. And if it doesn't, it will yell at you and tell you, in fact, specifically which one is missing. Uh, Path-dependent types is another interesting scholar one where it basically allows you to compute types and if you combine that, if you combine path-dependent types with type classes or implicits, uh, you, you can get some pretty cool things to happen, right? So, so type classes are effectively computing values, which are the instances, from a type. So you say, I want the monoid for int, and it'll go out and look for it based on the type. Path-dependent types will allow you to effectively compute a type given the type. Uh, so we'll see a, an example of that in a bit. Literal and singleton types then sort of lift values to the type level. And so now you can also compute values and types from values, which gets you an additional way to communicate to the compiler what you want. And uh, refinement types and, and algebraic data types or generalized algebraic data types allow you very, uh, to communicate to the compiler what domain you're working in. So anytime you're, you're working with like sum or working with option or working with either, the compiler understands the domain that you're working in. And if you do things like try to recover from an either, uh, assuming your, your error type is, is an ADT, it'll, the compiler will make sure that you're, you're covering all your error cases. So that's another way it can help you. So I'm gonna do a little bit of live coding, which uh, it always ends well. Uh, so can everyone see the code on the screen in the back? We're all good? Cool. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Uh, so we, I, I have this really dumb compute type class. Uh, so it takes it some, type, some value of type A and produces an integer. And so we can define an instance for int that just is the identity. Maybe we define an instance for say, string. Uh, let me do that real quick. And maybe we'll just do the size of that or something. Oh, let me 
make sure that compiles. Okay, well, that's okay, cool. Uh, and then somewhere else in our program, we can, write, uh, we can write a function that maybe takes in an A, and we can call this so long as A has a compute instance, and we'll do something dumb like just call into compute. Or maybe we'll do, we'll do this because we're fancy. And so now we can call go with uh, an integer. So that compiles, right? So what's happening here is uh, the type inferencer is figuring out that A is integer and it's conferring that indeed uh, compute is integer. So here you can sort of see that this compute type class is sort of us telling the compiler this is the kind of operations we want to abstract over and the various instances tell the compiler which operations are valid. Uh, and so here the compiler is making sure that we're doing valid things. So if I do a string here, that's fine. But if I do something that's bogus, it's going to yell at us. Uh, and then we can do something a little bit fancier, which is do something, uh, what, what I like to call inductive, uh, inductive instances. So I can say uh, list has a compute instance as long as uh, the, the elements inside the list have a compute instance. So I can do something like that, get the, and create a compute instance for a list. Ah, no, so this is what happens when I, uh, and now given the list of A, produce an int, and then I'll do something like that. No. Okay, what do you want? Error. Oh, okay, just the same error as before. Cool, so now when I call a list of one, two, three, it'll infer A to be list of int, and because, and it will go off and look for a compute list of int, and then it will see, okay, we can get a compute list of int if we have a compute of int, and it indeed finds a compute of int. And as expected, if I change this to doubles, it will yell at me, because there's no compute instance for double. So that's kind of boring. Let's make things more interesting. We're going to add a type member to compute, so now we're able to when the implicit resolution goes and looks for a value, it can also have a type attached to that value. So we're sort of computing types here. Uh, and so for this, let's make int go into a double. Uh, I'm going to delete this because I don't want to do this for every single instance. Uh, and then for string, maybe we'll do an option of a character or something. For here, I'll just do this. Ah, double. And then this one will become option of a character, and then this will be head option. I did not update the return type. Oh, yes, correct. Okay, cool. Uh, so let me make sure this compiles. Cool. So now when I this is not going to compile because uh, let's make that a little bit bigger. Yeah, so the compiler correctly is yelling at us because we can no longer assume that, uh, that the return type of go is int because the type that's returned will vary with whatever compute instance uh, gets computed. So it's helping us out of it a little bit there, and now I'm just gonna do that. So this is fine. And now when I call go with 42, uh, that works because we have a compute of int, but specifically we know that go of 42 is gonna give us back a double because the compiler here is smart enough to uh, retain the refinement associated with the instance, right? If, uh, so this, I didn't annotate the type on purpose, but if we did, it would look something like, uh, like that, I believe, all right? But here, for presentation purposes, I'm just uh, leaving that out. So it's actually smart enough to retain that type information, and it's able to propagate that all the way through. Daniel's gonna tell me I'm wrong now. No, no. <laughs> Uh, it would have to be attached to the type class, right? I, th <laughs> uh, I don't, if we added, uh, oh, maybe, I haven't tried. I'm not gonna try it on stage. Maybe we'll try it later. <laughs> uh, and then for string, uh, it knows enough information that it's an option of character and to sort of prove that it's training this, if I, if I annotate it with some bogus type, it, it yells at us. So. Again, we, we, we have a more expressive language to talk to the compiler now. We're, saying, we're telling the compiler for the int instance, I'm going to compute a double from that. And for the string instance, I'm going to compute a, uh, an option or a character of that. And the compiler is able to, to help us out if we try to use like, the return of go to 42 and call like, dot head on it or something like that. 
Um, now, I'm going to make this a little bit fancier now by adding in the idea of uh, literal types. If you try this in Scala today, it's not going to work because the mainline Scala compiler doesn't have literal types yet. I believe a pull request is out, uh, and I think Adrian is on a record saying he wants it in 2.12 at some point. Right now, I'm using, uh, for this project, I'm using the type level compiler. So if you go to typelevel.org slash Scala, uh, it's effectively a fork of uh, the Scala compiler with some really cool features in it, so I would encourage you to check it out. But uh, to sort of demo what I want to show, uh, let's get rid of this integer one. So let's say I define an instance not for int, but for, let's say, one. So literal types basically allow me to use literals in, as types, where the type one has only one inhabitant, and that's just the, the literal number one. So two would not be of type one, uh, which makes sense. Uh, and for this, let's say, I don't know, we'll use, in fact, I can use a literal type here, too. So compute with one. I'm going to return two, and because that's super interesting. Uh, we'll do another one with a string. So we'll do hello. Uh, here, let's do type level instead. New compute of type level. So again, I can use a string. So you can't do this with all literals. Like you put, couldn't put like a literal list in type position, I don't think. You can do it with, I believe, integers, strings, characters. Uh, I'm not too sure what the defining uh, characteristics for literals are, but it's not everything. Uh, and maybe for this, I'll make it list of in or something. Symbols work as well. Which one? Symbols. Oh, symbols. Symbols work as well. Cool. Uh, so here I'll have type level. I'll return a list of int. And we'll return to empty list, because why not? So now, let's make sure this works. Cool. So now, oh, so this isn't quite going to work yet, because, because Scala. Uh, so I have to do go literal because what happens is basically the, the inferencer will not will refuse to infer the actual singleton type, which is probably for the better. So you have to explicitly tell the inferencer you want the, the narrowest type possible. So you do that by telling it you want the a dot type instead of whatever a is inferred. Uh, so same thing. So now if I do go literal of goodbye, that's going to fail because we don't have an instance for that, and we don't have the, we don't have the corresponding string instance. Oh, well. oh, yeah, yeah. We don't have, so go, go will work, I believe. I hope it works. Go will work. Go literal will not work, because it will refine the goodbye string to be goodbye.type, and then it'll look for that instance, and, and it won't find it. But if I do this for type level, I think I called it type level, right? Yeah. If I do this for type level, it will compile and it will retain the information that it was a list of int, as before. And then I can also do go literal of one and it will retain the information that it was type two. Right? If I try to do three, it will yell at me. And if I try to do int, it will yell at me. Oh, we will? Yeah. Oh, no, because literals will subtype the, the upper class. It will not. Uh, but yeah, it, will, it retains the information that, that it's two. So now we've, we've gone from computing values from types to computing uh, types from types, and now computing types and values from values as well. So we see that uh, the more, uh, as we tell the compiler more and more information, the compiler is able to, to help us more and more. And if you sort of push on this a little bit, uh, you, if you push on implicits a little bit uh, with the path-dependent types and then use macros to sort of like nudge the, the, the compiler to do what you want, you can end up encoding something like shapeless as extensible records which uh, allow you to do something like, uh, let's say, speaker uh, will be me. And then, I don't know, uh, time zone, what? <laughs> time zone will be, in, I'll, I'll do eight for PST. And then uh, uh, city. And then I'll just put in a list, because why not? Let's make sure that compiles. I can index into speaker, and that will keep the information that that's a string, right? So if I put that into an integer, it'll explode. Uh, I can do time zone, and it'll keep the information that it's an integer. If I try to do bogus, it'll be, it'll yell at me. And same thing for uh, the city. And the more interesting part is if I try to index with some bogus string, it'll actually yell at me at compile time. And so you can, Shapeless provides this, uh, which is basically macros plus implicits plus path-dependent types. 
and then you can take this and push on a little bit more. So I, believe, I don't know if Frameless still does this, but at one point Frameless would have something like this backing the typed data frame, and that way when you did selects or try to compute across columns, it would be doing, it would first make sure the column name is valid, it would make sure that the function that you're applying between two columns was correctly typed and so on and so forth. Uh, this is also really useful just in any database-like thing where you're, you have a database schema. Uh, Shapeless has mechanisms where you can take, you can go from a case class and infer the, the singleton names of the fields uh, and keep the types as well. So, uh, so yeah, with in, inside Scala, we can do really cool things like this. And the more information you're communicating to the compiler, the more it's able to help you uh, along the way. So going back to the slides. Uh, I have some, uh, a couple other examples that I wanted to show, so outside of Scala, because I think we have, there's other things in other languages that are really cool as well. So a while ago, uh, Elm, if you've got, uh, who's heard of Elm here? Elm, Rust, cool. So the Elm guys, I believe, uh, wrote a blog post, I think it was either a year or two ago, on really, on compiler errors for humans, where they worked really hard on making sure that whatever compiler errors you get are very human readable. And that kicked off a lot of effort on Rust's part, as well as Dottie, I believe, and I'm sure other languages are, are looking at this as well, where the error they're giving you is, is sort of really readable and looking at it and hopefully you know what's going on, as opposed to trying to like decipher, like if you've seen like GCC compile errors, those can be like really terrible. Uh, so in Rust, the, the Rust language sort of has mechanisms for you to tell the compiler uh, characteristics of uh, your values, whether or not they're mutable, and if they are mutable, the, the type system will actually track like how you're using uh, those values and yell at you if you're doing something that's that's unsafe. And so you can imagine that as you can frame that as you're telling the compiler that these are my certain mutable variables, and in turn down the line, the compiler will track that. And if you're doing something unsafe, it will just fail to compile and tell you where where you're wrong. And with compiler friendly with uh, com human friendly compiler messages, uh, that becomes a lot more like a conversation that a compiler is having you uh, having with you. So you say, "This is my mutable variable," and the compiler is, "You're messing up here." So I think that's really cool, especially in the context of like Rust, where it's tracking uh, mutability for you. Uh, another example is type holes, which uh, I believe is in Haskell and Idris, and I assume in other dependently typed uh, languages as well. So in, in Haskell, you can you write down the type signatures of your code, and then if as you're implementing it, if you sort of forget or don't know what to do at that point, you can insert an underscore there. And when you go to hit compile, the compiler will actually tell you, like, I noticed you put an underscore there. Uh, I noticed there's a type hole there. This is the type of the thing that needs to be there in order uh, to satis to make everything type check. Right, so in this case, if you put an underscore there, the compiler will return, like, uh, put sterlin, which is the print function for Haskell, to make it go IO unit, and it'll return, like, PS, which also would when applied, because it knows on the right side is the string, so it knows when you apply the string, you get an IO of unit, which would type check. There's, um, there's a way that you actually Okay, yeah, so, so Daniel was saying, uh, in certain cases with Scala, if you, you, instead of putting an underscore, if you put triple question mark, the Scala compiler can tell you what sort of, uh, what, what it expects there. With help. With help. Okay, cool. Uh, so, so type holes in and of themselves, I think, are, were really cool. Uh, what was even cooler is, rec I believe recently, within the past week or two, they added, uh, it's, it's a patch is out, it's not in the mainline uh, GHC compiler yet, but they also added the ability for the compiler to tell you what values in scope match the type hole. So in, in this if we ran this through uh, that version of GHC, it would give us something like this, where it says, found a hole, expected, so list of characters, Haskell string. So found hole, string the IO of unit, in this expression, valid substitutions include these three functions that were in scope. And I think that's, uh, that's really cool, right? If you sort of just forget in a moment, you don't have to sort of think what's, what's in scope and, and, and what you need. You just put an underscore there and let the compiler tell you. And that's really another way that you can have a conversation with the compiler and where the compiler is working with you to achieve the kind of code that you want. Uh, other examples in other languages, we saw friendly compilers, we saw type holes. Uh, just in general, 
interesting and expressive type systems will, will give you this feeling. So Rust has, I believe, what are called affine types that, that track ownership. ATS has linear types. Uh, I believe there's a Haskell proposal out to add linear types into Haskell, which will be cool. Uh, we have refinement types, which we saw at Keynote 4, where you're sort of, you're not defining a new type, you're just in some, in some sort of language t uh, telling the compiler what sort of predicates you want on that type, and a compiler will help you track those. You don't have to track that yourself. And dependent types, where types are values, allow you to sort of get the kind of behavior we saw with literals and uh, path-dependent types, but in a much more first-class and cleaner way. Uh, that's all I had for you guys today. Uh, any questions? What would happen if we moved out into a parameter? Uh, I think it would work in certain cases. Uh, for for basically because we're in Scala, the, the compiler will have various issues. Various issues with uh, like the second you need to annotate the type. Uh, so if you if you put out as a type parameter, the implicit evidence you take would also have that type parameter on the surface, right? Which means that type parameter would also be in the surface. So if you need to, for whatever reason, uh, specify the type of the, the the A, then you would also need to specify the, the type parameter for for a second portion. So that's one of the reasons. And, and then there's also subtle issues with path dependent types versus uh, uh, type parameters in Scala. Oh, okay, so even if I put it like, oh, because because there's no multiple implicit parameter blocks, yeah. Yeah. You could lift it out with the aux trick. Would that work? Yeah, you would just be back to where you were otherwise. Good, good. Yay. <laughs> uh, Rob. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's a great series of blog posts. Typelevel.org slash blog. <laughs> Any other questions? Any tips to make the compiler work for you during implicit resolution? Uh, there's like tribal knowledge around like how to like make the compiler do what you want in certain in like very fancy cases. I don't actually have a list offhand. Uh, usually when I'm at that point, I just permute code until it works. It's a mix of, <laughs> it's a mix of some cases it wants the, the path dependent type, some, uh, like the a.out, and in some cases it wants the, the lifted type, and just depending on what you're doing, uh, the compiler will do different things. I don't really have a list for you. Oh, there's, uh, what's it called? What's the thing that tracks implicits? Uh, the, there's a compiler flag you can emit. Uh, log, yeah, so I think dash y log implicits will make the, dash x log implicits will make the compiler spit out and very verbosely all the implicit resolution that's happening. So if you're debugging implicit resolution issues, that, that can be helpful. Cool, thank you very much.